1982, I gave the Christmas lectures at Rockefeller University, and there teachers came and asked me how I did many demonstrations that indicated that they weren't familiar with uh, modern techniques in cell biology. And I reasoned if they weren't familiar with those techniques, they weren't familiar with many things going on contemporary, in contemporary science, and that the best way to bring them up to speed might be to invite them into university laboratories to do research for a couple of summers. It was a natural fit and a really great opportunity to have someone be able to come in and to see exactly what people do all day long, what, how they put those skills to work, um, and, and how important they are that they really master those skills and be able to, um, to, to use them every single day. The reason for uh, founding the program uh, was to focus on the students, and I reasoned that the best way to improve student learning was to improve the capacity of their teachers. I think uh, teachers, like any other profession, need continuous education, uh, further training, and if science teachers actually work in a real lab, that gives them different perspective than what they probably normally do and can do in a classroom. The teachers spend four days a week for eight weeks in two summers in the laboratory doing hands-on laboratory things, and one day a week in, uh, in science-specific professional development. Uh, teachers tell us all the time that from these laboratory experiences, they've learned new techniques that they can bring back to their schools so their students can uh, be trained in laboratories with contemporary uh, research techniques. We would like to make sure that students know that when they're in school and learning this skill set that we really expect that they will remember that and be able to use it and be able to use it readily. When they go back to their schools they're going to stop saying that's right and that's wrong and ask the student why do you think that? Because understanding the reason for the right answer is as important as knowing the right answer. The teachers tell us uh, that they change the way they approach their students. Being neophytes in the lab themselves, they are much more uh, forgiving and sympathetic to the students as they come into the lab and find it difficult to get oriented. In my first couple of years of teaching, I think I was a lot more, this is what the answer should be, let's do the correct steps so we get at that correct answer. And it's a lot more fun if science is messy and kids get to make those mistakes and figure out how to learn from those mistakes. I really try to instill an environment with them that it is important, not just okay, important that we get questions wrong so that we can talk about it and really learn from it. I found my students get a lot more out of running an experiment and getting the answers wrong or having a wrong procedure per se and discussing, you know, where did it go wrong? They get a lot more out of that than me saying, all right, here's how you should run your experiment. Here's what you should get out of it. If you don't get that, you did it wrong. To do more inquiry based so they have that opportunity to fail and failing is okay because you learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. So if they just follow a set of instructions and did it, they're really not learning anything from it. The whole inquiry thing um, is a hot topic in science education. So I kind of, and all the other teachers, we've learned more to just prepare the students for, okay, here's your goal, here's your task, here's what you're working with, and you just have to kind of let them roll with it. That's all being in a lab is about. 99% of the time, your research doesn't work out perfectly and shoot out confetti for you. We just grew our own plants under a light, different uh, nutrients supplied to the soil, and that was pretty interesting to see, like, different levels of nitrogen in the soil, how it affected so much the growth of the plants. We're working on an a, a lab right now where we're determining the acid, like the pH and mass of eggs and shells over time in acids and bases and what will happen and stuff. So if we got an answer that we wouldn't expect, I guess that's just kind of how science works. It's constantly changing. You don't really know what's going to happen. A couple groups had the nitrogen deficient soil actually grew more and you know that wasn't the results we were expecting at all. So we were kind of forced to go look back, you know, maybe what factors did we change from pot to pot that didn't keep it constant to a 
affect that growth and was there a different amount of water for each plant was there a different amount of light and you just go back and look through human errors in any sort of lab situation when something goes wrong we go back and we figure out why it went wrong and where it went wrong and that kind of determines the source of the problem i've definitely given the kids a lot more independence on the labs um, that has given them more opportunity to fail in that way and be able to look at their experiments and really decide what's gone well and what hasn't. Bringing that to the classroom and saying, because something didn't work, it doesn't mean it's a failure. It just means we have to revamp it for next time and being okay with change. So I have to kind of um, ask them some questions and say, well, maybe you could try this this way, or what did you think about this? And then I have to be able to walk away. Having them work through that, um, find the possible errors, go back and make those corrections. With the lab with a spectrophotometer, if you don't get 90% uh, accuracy, then you have to go back and do it again. So it's just trial and error, trial and error. And when they finally get that 90%, they're excited and they finally have accomplished something. I think science, especially in the biological science, will become much more quantitative than it has been. It's no longer yes or no, or just, just present or absent. You have to actually quantify things. And in order to do that, you need to have much better mathematical skills, data analytic skills. If you look at like Common Core, any of that stuff, it's not a simple yes or no answer. It's just not rote memorization. You have to be able to explain it in detail and you have to, under, you have to be able to understand it in order to explain it. Can you actually um, provide proof for what you are saying? Like can you come up with an argument and um, proof for why you believe that that is true? So a lot of times I'll say, well, you know, how did you get to that point? Why do you think that way? And they have to actually explain it with evidence or proof from the lab. All scientists understand that this country is in dire straits when it comes to science education. That we're not educating a large enough uh, percentage of our population. If the teachers can motivate the children that are interested in science or technology or math, the classical STEM fields, then those kids might probably go on to an undergrad degree in the STEM fields. And if they are motivated in high school, they're probably motivated in college, and that will make them better employees for the technology-oriented private industries. They know there'll be no graduate students and no postdocs if these kids don't do well in high school, well in college and then go on. I began partnering uh, with uh, Questar 3 because I realized that the BOCES are the ideal center for expanding this program to a statewide program. Questar 3 had the vision and uh, the administrative skill to take on this program. I visited your program You've taken everything that we've done, replicated it beautifully, and expanded on it. Uh, your program is extremely creative, and the enthusiasm I see in the teachers who are participating in the Questar 3 program is enormous. Caitlin, on her own, had gotten to meet a number of our production engineers and brought them together and asked them, what were the shortcomings in your high school education and what would you like to see done differently? Traditional science instruction is, you know, lecture, do a lab, and talk about the results that you already told me are the results that we should find. Once they get comfortable with being wrong or being partially correct, they really start to think through, well, why did, it this, why did this happen this way? How could I fix it? And that's how science is done. Science is, you know, we ran this experiment, here's what we found. What did we really find? What does this mean? And then we discuss that and we apply it to new situations. And so that's what I try to model my class more like. Having them set it up, create it, make those predictions of what they think is gonna happen, and then when they find out that they're wrong, that's okay. Um, but they have to figure out why. And it's sometimes the why is the hardest part, but they learn more from those whys than they do than anything else. I always tell the kids that it's fine if you get it wrong as long as we can go somewhere from that and have an important discussion that leads us to the right place. We did a potato osmosis experiment the other day and instead of being a linear relationship and things just happen in a straight line, we had all of these mountains on our graph that appeared and the kids 
took ownership of that and figured out, well, here's how my group could have goofed to throw off the rest of everybody else's data. Remember that nothing happens in a school that is not led by a teacher in the classroom. It's in the interests of the business community in New York State uh, to help fund uh, programs of this sort. The central issue uh, for improving science education is improving teachers' ability to teach it. We've had teachers who've been teaching for 15 or 16 years. When they applied to the program, I would ask them, are you going to keep teaching? And they've said yes, and uh, they've done very well in the program and gone back to their school. And later, when I've talked with them, they've said, well, I thought I'd teach three or four more years after I finished the program. But you know, I'm succeeding now at a level I never succeeded before. So uh, teaching is now a really exciting activity for me. I don't want to retire. I want to keep teaching. Being in a lab was a completely scary thing. Beneficial, but scary. Um, I think being in that situation where you're a learner again, and being in the shoes where you're like, I don't know how this works. It was literally like being my 14 year old students again. A lot of the techniques I ended up using, I hadn't done since college. So I know that whenever I'm presenting something new to my students, I know that they can be a little intimidated, a little nervous, a little scared. I think it's helped kind of predict questions that they're gonna have because you know that certain parts are gonna be tricky in advance, I think and you can troubleshoot those and say, this part might not work, but here's how we can get it to work for us. Um, so that they don't shut down and become frustrated. It's just a great way to challenge yourself, um, a great way to be more comfortable with doing inquiry um, based, you're doing research, you're doing full inquiry where, and being more comfortable being able to bring that to your students. I found that I'm more excited about science, I tend to have more fun with it, and I also kind of let my guard down a little bit more and I, I let the students discover more. It reinvigorates you as a teacher and you realize that there's so much more out there. I learned something so much over the past two years that I couldn't wait to get back into school and share it with the kids. So I think that, you know, that old adage, you can't teach an old dog a new trick, that's not necessarily true because, I, you know, those two years I learned so much and a lot of that I brought back into the classroom. And it's like, oh kids, we're going to talk about something. I want to tell you about what I did. It puts you back into being a learner, which I think many of us, I think, forget about because we're so used to wearing our teacher hats when we should be wearing both or juggling both at the same time. It gets you excited about science. Um, and you really bring that back into the room, and that's important for your students. Someone has that much experience, and you know she's that smart in this field. You know, you really buy into what she's saying, and you know it's not just someone who's here to get a paycheck. This is generally, genuinely, what she loves to do, and it's interesting. She makes this class fun, and you know you want to come to it every day. First day of school is what you do over your summer vacation. We had a brief conversation and I showed them what I did in the lab and they're like, holy cow. We can say that this is what's going on. You need to know this and this is the reason why because I just did this for two years. You're going off to college, you're going to do anything science STEM related. These are things that you need to know. If the BOCES had the resources to uh, gather the science teachers from uh, the schools in its district and uh, place them in neighboring state university laboratories uh, and in private university laboratories. Uh, it could change science education in New York State and make New York State the, uh, the leader in science education in the United States and the model for how to develop high quality science education. These teachers will forever be superior teachers.